Good afternoon, everyone, or indeed good morning or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from in the world. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to the launch of the Sustainable Gas Institute's fifth white paper uh, titled The Flexibility of Gas, What Is It Worth? Um, just before we start, a couple of housekeeping points. Uh, firstly, if you'd like to ask questions, you're able to do so throughout the event. It uh, should be on the top right of your screen. You can, you can type your question in there and uh, it will be looked at. And secondly, subtitles are available uh, for the presentation throughout uh, in six languages, in Korean, Chinese, French, German, Spanish and Portuguese. Uh, the technical details of those subtitles may not be the most accurate thing ever, but they can they can certainly help you along in those languages. Uh, just so just to introduce myself very quickly, I'm the chair of the session today. My name is Adam Hawkes. Uh, I'm a reader in the Department of Chemical Engineering and uh, I'm director of the Sustainable Gas Institute. Uh, next slide, please. So just very briefly to introduce the Sustainable Gas, Gas Institute or the SGI as we call it. Uh, I just want to spend just three slides on this before we get into the main event. Uh, our mission statement is on the screen in front of you. So just very briefly, we were established in 2014 by BG Group. Uh, and since then we've expanded out, we've funded now by Shell, uh, several, several parts of industry and the research councils. I think the important thing to point out here is the SGI is not only focused on natural gas, uh, we're also inter 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 interested in various other low carbon energy gases like hydrogen and uh, biomethane. Next slide, please. So the reason we find gas interesting in the energy system is, is around this challenge on the left of your screen there. So basically there, there's a lot of sources of natural gas in the world. Not only natural gas, also hydrogen and biomethane are now interesting. But on the other hand, we have very strict climate budgets and indeed the Paris Agreement are requiring essentially zero emissions worldwide by 2050 or 2060. Uh, create, creates a lot of challenges for the use of all types of energy across the spectrum. So the SGI takes an interdisciplinary approach to this problem. You can see those five bullet points there, uh, starting with engineering and technology, so very much the focus of Imperial College, but then broadening out, particularly focused on climate change, economics, energy security and policy and regulation. Uh, we try to take an industry perspective to this problem. So think about how industry sees the challenges and what they might do uh, to, to address them. Uh, next slide, please. So we do this by our five main areas of research. The first one there on the top left is evidence-based reviews. Uh, you're going to see an example of one of them today and I'll introduce it a little bit more in a moment. We also do research in hydrogen and methane. So hydrogen is a very important possible future energy carrier, gaseous energy carrier in heat, transport, power generation and industry. And methane research is a very current uh, uh, challenge for the industry where methane emissions lead to some global warming. We also look at uh, novel modelling approaches using some agent based modelling techniques for integrated assessments like you might see in the IPCC and we do member specific tailored research to to uh, those who are interested in gas and future energy systems. So this is a very brief introduction to the SGI. Uh, without further ado, I want to introduce the white paper series. So next slide, yes. Um, so the SGI white paper series is our is our series of evidence based reviews. Uh, you're going to see Jamie presenting one today. Really the idea here is that these papers address topical and controversial issues related to the future of gas in low carbon energy systems. They, they, they try to establish the evidence on those topics by a synthesis of a huge range of evidence across the spectrum from academia through to government papers through to industry perspectives to try to really synthesize down the key messages from that evidence for decision makers. Uh, so the idea of the white papers is not just for academic impact, it's very much for impact across the spectrum for industry, government, all of those decision makers who, who have a stake in this, in this space. So next slide, please. 
Okay, I'm going to just very briefly introduce who we have here today to talk to you. So firstly, we have uh, Dr. Jamie Spears. I'll introduce more in just a moment, but he's the lead author of the white paper. Uh, we also have two panelists to, to provide comment on the white paper. Uh, firstly, joining us from Melbourne will be Professor Pier Luigi Mansarella, who is the Chair of Electrical Power Systems at the Melbourne Energy Institute. And we also have Camila Palladino, who's the Executive Vice President of Corporate Strategy and Relations at SNAM, and SNAM being the Italian gas transmission operator. Uh, my co-chair today is Professor Nigel Brandon, uh, who's the Dean of Engineering, and will be dealing with the Q&A later on. Uh, next slide. So just before I hand over to Jamie, I want to briefly introduce him. So Jamie is a research fellow at the Sustainable Gas Institute. He leads our white paper series, and he's been doing this kind of thing for a very long time. Uh, he joined Imperial College in 2007, working in the Centre for Environmental Policy, uh, before joining the Sustainable Gas Institute in 2016. Uh, he conducts research on social, technical, economic issues affecting energy policy in the UK, Europe and globally. And like I said, he leads our white paper series and previously led the white paper series for the Energy U UK Energy Research Centre. Uh, he's examined a lot of different issues via this approach, including supply of critical met metals, macroeconomic impacts on employment of changes to renewable energy, and uh, looking at the future of unabated coal. Jamie, Jamie has uh, an MSc and a PhD from Imperial College. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Jamie to introduce the white paper. OK, thanks, Adam, and thanks everybody joining us to hear findings of our latest white paper, and this one looking at the flexibility of gas and the value that it provides to the energy system. And I just wanted to start off with uh, some uh, background as to why we're asking, or why we're looking at this topic. So natural gas uh, currently provides the energy system with significant uh, daily and seasonal flexibility, so uh, delivering energy ag against very challenging daily and seasonal variations in demand. But when we look at decarbonisation scenarios, um, we see that these often assume large reductions in the amounts of gas used in the energy system. Um, however, that may be introducing significant challenges to the electricity system in uh, continuing to deliver flexibility in a world where um, flexibility challenges might actually be increasing. And, and gases might still be interesting given their complementary characteristics uh, and that st still might be interesting to examine them uh, in terms of their flexibility. And just to illustrate what uh, we're talking about here when we're talking about uh, daily and seasonal uh, variability in demand, uh, I present a couple of pictures here, which uh, many of you may be familiar with already. So I'll just talk to these very quickly. But on the left here, we have um, the transmission system demand in the UK based on national grid data, showing over a number of years uh, the significant variation between summer and winter demand for energy. Um, and on the right, uh, a figure here presented in uh, Wilson and Rowley's excellent work for the UK Energy Research Centre last year looking at uh, the UK's uh, line pack, so that is the gas energy stored in pipes in the gas network, and how that changes uh, significantly over the day as the operator uses that line pack in order to meet daily variation in demand. Now, this is closely related to a topic that we've examined already in detail in a previous white paper. Um, so in our third white paper, um, A Greener Gas Grid, we examine the structure of gas networks and the opportunity to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from those networks and what that might cost. Um, we try not to go over that detail again in this report, um, but you can go back and look at that uh, on the uh, SGI white paper series website. But the question for this report that we are discussing today is much more around 
the flexibility provided by gas networks um, and, and what that delivers to the energy system. We look at how gas networks do this um, and how that has changed um, over time recently, particularly. Um, what that uh, structure of flexibility mechanisms means in terms of gas price and what it costs to deliver this uh, variability. Uh, the impact that that has uh, in terms of greenhouse gas emissions associated with the flexible operation of gas networks. And um, what might happen in the future if we uh, maintain gas networks uh, uh, without impacting on our ability to meet climate targets, how does flexibility change in that world? Now, I've um, I put there at the bottom of this slide our working definition of flexibility in this case. Um, I'm not going to dwell on this, but we are looking at the gas network's ability to meet changes in supply and demand over time and spatial scales and um, what that might be worth in terms of economic or other costs. Now, <clears throat> this is a slide that we always present around the evidence review methodology that we use, um, which is uh, based around systematic review and is adapted from the UK Energy Research Centre's process. Um, that table in the background there is in the report, and I won't talk to the detail of that, um, but you can find it there. But the broad strokes of our process are that we conduct a systematic review of the literature to gather together our evidence for analysis. We convene an expert panel of experts across uh, various sectors and stakeholder groups in order to help advise the report as you go through it and then this bit that we're doing today launching the final report which gathers together our analysis and tries to present it to the decision making audience that we are trying to inform okay so back to gas networks um, and how do they deliver the flexibility that we're talking about well there are a number of ways that gas networks do this and i present some of them in this slide to start with, um, uh, for a number of countries, uh, gas production can be varied um, and that can be done uh, to meet uh, the demand in the gas market. Um, for some countries, this is not possible if they don't have gas production or if gas production is limited in its flexibility for economic or technical reasons. Um, there's line pack, which I, I briefly mentioned earlier, so that is the energy stored in gas pipes and gas networks um, and by varying the pressure of those uh, uh, pipes the amount of energy stored uh, can be varied essentially using the pipework as uh, storage close to the point of demand and um, more traditional types of storage like underground geological storage or surface facilities can be used particularly for seasonal uh, demand flexibility. Um, and then imports, an increasingly important aspect of, uh, of gas networks is the ability to import gas from other countries, either through interconnected pipelines or through the LNG market in ships to importing terminals uh, in whichever country you're interested in. And then gas can also play a flexibility role in delivering energy to flexible power generation to help meet flexibility on the electricity um, side of the energy system. And in the future, we might add a couple of um, other mechanisms to the flexibility role that gas networks might play, including power to gas, that is the, the use of um, electricity from renewables to produce gas, maybe at a time where um, renewables are producing but electricity demand is low and you can use low cost electricity at that time to produce gas for storage or to be injected into the grid and used at another time. And hybridization or increasing opportunities to integrate gas and electricity networks uh, in order to uh, do things like supporting uh, uh, flexible generation or indeed um, using electricity and gas at different times for the same service throughout the year in order to take advantage of their complementary characteristics. Now, um, I'm just going to talk through a couple of those options in a little bit more detail um, uh, with some data examples. So this is again looking at data from National Grid on the national transmission system in the UK. 
um, to to examine in a little bit more detail uh, line pack and what it delivers in terms of energy flexibility. And um, this is data over the course of a day on the 1st of March 2018, which um, was a particularly cold day. And it shows the way in which the energy stored in the pipework uh, is increased um, overnight uh, and uh, discharged throughout the day in order to meet daily demands for energy. Um, this demonstrates in the order of 300 gigawatt hours of energy shifted over the course of that day. And we can compare that to what might be discharged from pump storage in the UK on the electricity system uh, in a day which is in the order of 18 gigawatt hours per day. This is a comparison that's also made in the work I previously mentioned by Wilson and Rowley for the UK Energy Research Centre um, in their examination of line pack and its contribution. More traditional types of storage are presented here. This figure is for the UK and Europe showing a number of different countries and comparing their um, gas storage and working gas storage in those countries against gas demand in those countries in years. Um, and the um, size of the bubble in this figure is essentially the percentage of working gas storage as a percentage of gas demand in those countries. Um, this shows a kind of general trend in the order of about 30% storage as a percentage of, of gas demand. Um, uh, and an interesting thing here is that is the UK sitting significantly below that general trend. Um, a number of studies have looked at the energy security implications of that uh, situation in the UK and the amount of storage that we have, and um, particularly when uh, domestic generation, domestic production of gas has been decreasing. In this study, we are not looking at the energy security aspects of this story, although they are clearly important and related. Um, now on to imports and the role that imports might play in this story. Um, here is a figure uh, based on UK government data looking at imports through pipelines and through the LNG market. Um, and one of the interesting things here is first the way in which this also follows the seasonal demand profile that we've discussed earlier. Um, and the uh, important role that Norwegian uh, pipeline gas plays in supplying these imports, but also the increasing role in uh, recent years that LNG um, has played uh, in gas imports in the UK. OK, so now a couple of slides looking at the economic impacts of this flexibility story um, and how it has evolved. This uh, figure here shows uh, what's known as the summer winter price spread. That's essentially a comparison of gas prices um, uh, in the summer versus the winter, showing how much more it costs to deliver gas uh, in the winter, essentially a, a, a metric for how difficult it is to meet um, seasonal demand for gas energy. Um, and the important thing to take away from this, although it's a, a busy slide with lots of dots, is the general trend in the reduction in the summer winter price spread, indicating um, uh, to some extent the uh, reducing cost of meeting that challenging seasonal flexibility problem. Now that trend in the reduction of this uh, price spread is in attributed in the literature to the increasing role for imports which have created a competitive uh, market uh, for gas delivery on these seasonal timescales and reduced uh, the costs of meeting that spread. And a similar trend can be seen as if we look out to Europe. So this is uh, gas delivered in Europe um, and the price between summer and winter uh, showing the same trend um, over uh, the years from 2008 to 2018. And again, uh, the literature pointing to the role of international imports in producing that situation. So the competitiveness of gas markets helping reduce the cost of meeting seasonal demand. Um, this has had implications for gas storage, which I try to illustrate in these two slides here. So on the left, we have the cost of storage against the summer winter price spread for a number of different countries. And the takeaway from this slide is that um, often the summer winter price spread is significantly lower than the cost of storage uh, 
making a very challenging economic uh, situation for storage operators. And on the right, um, a slide based on uh, IEA data looking at the cumulative storage closures in Europe from 2013 to 2017, showing that um, storage has been closing over that period of time um, related to that challenging um, economic situation. And now flexibility and um, greenhouse gas emissions uh, story as part of that flexibility. So in the reports to examine this issue, what we have looked at is the use of energy in the gas network operation um, uh, to, to understand the role of greenhouse gas emissions in the flexible operation of grass grids. And this figure shows uh, gas use by grid operators, um, LNG terminals and storage um, uh, operators. Um, that gas uh, use or that energy requirement is largely for things like compressors and other processes used to um, make the grid work. Um, and you can see here the seasonal variation um, in that uh, energy use um, as it takes more energy to move around the increasing uh, demand in the winter period. Other interesting things happening in this figure, the, the role of LNG appearing and increasing in, in recent years and uh, the role of storage energy in operating storage sites decreasing um, as the role of storage has decreased. And we can examine that uh, energy use in terms of the uh, greenhouse gas implications of that flexible use of the network by looking at the difference between the energy use in summer and winter and expressing that as a, a grams of CO2 equivalent per kilowatt hour of energy delivered, which is what we're doing in this figure here. Um, the broad takeaway from this is that the marginal or additional greenhouse gas implications for operating the grid uh, to meet that flexibility requirement is in the order of one to two grams of CO2 uh, per kilowatt hour uh, and decreasing uh, over time. Now that uh, decrease is um, related to the uh, movement away from gas to energy as the energy vector used to power these processes. Um, that gives you an, an idea of the order that's of greenhouse gas emissions additionally needed to operate the ga gas network flexibly. So what might uh, happen to gas networks in the future and how might that impact this flexibility story? So um, in the report, we highlight a number of challenges for future gas networks in terms of flexibility. Um, the first to highlight here is that gas networks in the future, in order to meet um, uh, greenhouse gas reduction targets, it might introduce more hydrogen or operate hydrogen natural gas blends, and that's something that's being examined in a number of demonstration projects and in a number of scenarios. Um, and that will reduce the energy density of those networks. Now that has an impact for flexible operation in that, for example, line pack of a hydrogen network might be uh, significantly less than the equivalent natural gas network. And that might be uh, part of the story might be uh, the energy density of that gas, but also the way in which the gas network is operated in terms of gas flows and operating pressures. And the same problem might um, be experienced in storage. Um, one study that examined uh, the UK gas storage site Rough, which is now closed, but um, theoretically, if it was to operate with hydrogen, um, it would store less than half of the energy uh, that it could store if it was storing natural gas. And that clearly is a challenge either for the uh, quantity of flexibility provision or the cost of providing equivalent flexibility. And um, another aspect uh, that might be challenging for future gas networks is that gas networks in the future might be um, more fragmented, smaller and separated systems, and they're likely to have less uh, in, in terms of access to uh, international trade for low carbon gas at least initially, um, and that uh, challenge might mean that these gas networks require more uh, or rely more on underground storage as a way to meet the seasonal um, variation and manage the flexibility of seasonal demand. And that's certainly something we see in the proposals for demonstrations of hydrogen networks um, that are currently on the table. 
um, and that if we think back a couple of slides previously to the story that the natural gas network has benefited very much from the competitiveness of international uh, imports as a way to reduce the cost of meeting seasonal demand might um, have an impact on the cost of meeting seasonal demand uh, in a low carbon gas network of the future. Um, and to illustrate this challenge a little bit um, on this figure here, we compare some estimates of hydrogen uh, underground storage with uh, natural gas. Um, and whilst um, the lower end of that range of hydrogen uh, storage uh, cost estimates might be um, in the same order as uh, cost in natural gas underground storage, the, the top end of that range is significantly more expensive. Um, and for a little bit of context, I, I put there that battery costs might be in the order of £100 per kilowatt hour in terms of storage costs rather than the range that we see here. Um, it's not entirely a fair apples to apples comparison, but it's useful um, for some context. Um, in the report, we also look at the modelling literature of future gas systems to see what that says, and a couple of themes emerge. Um, the first I highlight there is that the, the literature uh, looks at an increasing um, options for integration and hybridisation between electricity and gas grids as being beneficial both to decarbonisation and costs for those modelled systems. Um, this includes providing um, gas energy for flexible backup generation to help support the electric electricity system um, and increasing hybridisation of the use of gas and electricity networks so we might be able to use uh, gas uh, at times of winter peak in, for example, a hybrid heat pump, uh, but relying on electricity for um, the rest of the year and taking advantage, therefore, of the complementary characteristics between electricity and gas networks. Um, and these studies also highlight the increasing role for CCS and low carbon gases in, for example, um, uh, providing energy and or capturing carbon from flexible backup generation. Um, supporting deeper penetrations of renewables and um, helping facilitate uh, deeper carbon reductions. Um, um, I'm near the end of my slides now. I just wanted to highlight a couple of things that are in uh, the report that we haven't had time to talk about here. And um, the report looks at um, global modelling and the implications for flexibility and gas networks there. And um, there's some discussion of the United States, which has not been covered in the slides. And there's also a case study of Brazil which we think is particularly interesting as a counterpoint to the European and United States examples that we have discussed already in that Brazil has um, less extensive gas networks um, it has less of a challenge in terms of its seasonal flexibility um, with it as it largely does not have the same seasonal heat demand um, and it already has significant penetration of low carbon electricity in its electricity mix through um, hydroelectric. Um, and one of the things that we examine in that case study is, for example, the opportunity for uh, biogas or biomethane from the sugarcane industry to uh, fuel and decarbonize backup generation to help support um, increasing penetrations of renewables and the existing um, hydroelectric system uh, in Brazil. OK, so to gather up findings um, and to summarize uh, gas networks have uh, delivered flexible energy on daily and seasonal time scales at relatively low cost uh, and low additional emissions and it and it seems to have done that fairly well for a, a, a number of years um, but there are challenges for gas networks in the future in terms of removing uh, their associated greenhouse gases so that they can still uh, exist and provide the benefit of their um, flexible characteristics um, and low carbon gases uh, might also provide flexibility in the future, but there will be changes to that potential for those networks to provide flexibility. And it's very important to understand what these uh, net gas network changes means in terms of the flexibility provision and the cost of doing so. And there are a number of uh, opportunities for future research that we highlight in the report that we think are quite important. Um, the first one I pick up here is that there are a number of ongoing network demonstrations uh, to largely test the technical safety and, and cost implications of um, 
transitioning to low carbon gas networks. Um, but there's opportunities, I think, to better understand uh, how these uh, new gas networks can be operated flexibly to help support the energy system and we can maybe do more there to understand that. Um, the effort, the ongoing effort in whole systems modelling to understand um, how these gas networks might operate out to the future, into the future and um, to 2050 uh, to help understand the flexibility, the value of the way in which the gas network will change and to help better compare with the other flexibility options that energy systems have available to them is another important area. And also how operation of these future gas networks in a flexible manner might impact on the greenhouse gas emissions associated is an important area that we feel uh, maybe deserves more examination. That's everything from me. Thanks very much for your attention. Just some quick acknowledgements. Thanks to all of the authors who helped put together this paper. Thanks to all, all of those who uh, were involved in the expert panel and provided excellent feedback and advice as the report unfolded. Um, and thanks to the whole team at SGI for all their support. Thanks very much. OK, for now, I would like to to hand over to uh, our first panelist, who is Pierre Luigi Mansarella. So just by way of introduction, uh, if we could have the next slide, please. By way of introduction, so Pierre Lu Luigi Mansarella is joining us from COVID lockdown Melbourne. So thank you very much for that, Pierre Luigi. Uh, so he is a chair, professor of electrical power systems at the University of Melbourne in Australia, and also professor of smart energy systems at the University of Manchester in the UK. Uh, he obtained his PhD in power systems from the Politecnico in Torino, Italy. He's been a research associate here at Imperial College and has held various visiting positions in Europe, USA and South America. Uh, he's been involved in more than 50 research projects and various professional activities, uh, very much in the area of this white paper. So that's on things such as the techno-economics and business case for smart grid technologies. It is about risk and resilience of future networks. Uh, it's about integrated multi-energy systems modeling and about energy infrastructure and investment under uncertainty. He's the author of more than 200 research papers, editor on several IEEE journals, and a distinguished lecturer for IEEE and past chair of the Energy Working Group of a European IEEE uh, initiative. So I think very well qualified to comment on the paper and uh, I'll hand over to Pierre Luigi now for that. Thank you, Adam, for the kind introduction and uh, for the uh, opportunity and kind of invitation to be uh, to be here it's a great pleasure i say that uh, i really enjoyed re uh, reading the the white paper i found it very interesting and really uh, insightful uh, what i thought i would do is i would just provide uh, a couple of links uh, to um, ongoing research uh, in the area particularly looking at uh, interaction with uh, the electric system which effectively is one of my main interest uh, as, uh, as you mentioned. Uh, and I thought uh, I would put here, as you can see a slide, uh, uh, a little bit summarizing the idea of flexibility, not so much uh, only in terms of understanding its in, its individual energy vectors, but rather, but rather uh, in terms of integrated energy system, we're called here multi-energy um, system. There is a, a definition there, which um, of course is like, um, can, we can debate about it, but let, let's take it as sort of working definition for flexibility in this kind of multi-energy system context, which we defined some time ago in, in this publication as a set uh, of all feasible deviations in the flows of an energy vector, starting from a given operating point, and subject to multi-energy node and system constraints. Now, what is this multi-edge node? Multi-edge node is effectively uh, this, uh, what would you see in the, in the picture? Imagine that you have some kind of energy hub. There are multiple uh, energy vectors and networks uh, coming to input. And, that, and then this node is supplying 
uh, number of local loads, which are multi-energy uh, loads, can be electricity, heat, uh, cooling, and, and, and all that. Maybe also some form of local generation. Now, because you have multiple networks and energy vectors getting to the node, inside, in fact, you have a number of conversions. You have the, uh, you may have the options of uh, um, multiple forms of energy storage. So there is a possibility, a technical possibility of actually shifting from one energy vector to another. You can do this internally to this kind of multi-energy node. Uh, and uh, because in fact you have a number of degrees of freedom to reach a, a given multi-energy demand point uh, by internal energy, energy shifting across energy vectors. But you can also see this uh, as external to the system. Because you can have this kind of internal energy shifting inside the, the, the hub, the multi-energy node, then you can actually change the flows in energy uh, in, 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 the, in the vectors that get into the hub and therefore the flows effectively in the energy networks. So when you look at this from a system perspective, therefore uh, one, one would understand how the flexibility that uh, is, is a potentially coming from this interaction optimization uh, across energy vectors can actually be mapped uh, against the specific uh, uh, energy energy vectors. So for example, you can take out of several energy vectors, you, you can take specific electricity and gas, and then trying to study how the flexibility that the gas network, the gas system, the gas devices uh, uh, got would actually impact in a positive or negative way on the flexibility of the uh, electricity system. Now, when you look at this as a, as a, as a whole, uh, there is uh, effectively superior flexibility that uh, is embedded in this uh, multi-energy system if you compare to just uh, uh, considering an electricity-only system or a gas-only system. As, as I was mentioned earlier, the superior flexibility is really coming from the fact uh, that uh, you have more uh, degrees of freedom, flexibility variables, effectively, when you look at the uh, optimized system. You can look at this from different perspectives, again, looking at uh, the interaction of electricity and gas in particular. For example, as uh, uh, Jenny was mentioning, you could look at how the gas, uh, gas flexibility is actually providing some form of positive flexibility to the electricity system, for example, by balancing, by gas turbines and all, and all that. Uh, there may be flexibility options by dual fuels, again, as mentioned by Jay, uh, Jamie and as uh, we, we will see in uh, the uh, in the white paper, again shifting from one vector to another, for example, to reduce uh, the the peak consumption on the uh, electricity system. But you can also have some flexibility that can be coming from the electricity system onto the gas uh, um, natural effect, in the form of flexibility like the opposite direction. For example, we talk about power to heat, somehow power to gas. For example, we would look at injecting, as again was mentioned, uh, and it is mentioned in the white paper, injecting um, uh, excess renewables into the gas network, for example, by, by hydrogen. So this is another form of uh, uh, flexibility. And again, you can see, you can look at this kind of interacting flexibility between gas and electricity in, uh, in, in from a double perspective, double direction. Uh, can we have the, the next slide, please? And uh, in, in here, I wanted to uh, stress an important point that was mentioned in the white paper, this of uh, effectively, again, the line pack uh, flexibility we would see uh, in the future with the changes uh, in the system, for example, due to electrification, but also due to having more and more hydrogen in, uh, uh, in the network. In this studies that we were running um, some time ago for the, uh, for the UK national grid, uh, what we saw is that in future scenarios, effectively, we would just see more and more uh, challenges, as again mentioned in the white paper, in terms of balancing the system through the available line pack. And this actually happens pretty much in all scenarios, because in scenarios they are more sort of dominated by a gas, but of course with lots of renewables. Sometimes the gas network would be so stressed actually that there would be some uh, effective flexibility uh, constraints that would arise. On the other hand, in uh, the case of more and more electrifications, we, we saw that we still need lots of gas for balancing 
purposes. However, because the line park would be less, again, the, the gas meter would be very much stretched in terms of uh, pro providing this flexibility onto the electricity system. What we saw is that uh, this, this sort of stretch uh, in terms of constraints in the gas network will become so substantial. That actually, at times, the flexibility of the gas uh, uh, network, or in some cases, the lack of flexi flexibility in the gas network would very heavily impact uh, on the flexibility of the electricity system. In fact, uh, what we we'll see is that uh, we will need to, uh, so, so to constrain basically the operation of the electricity system subject to the constraints in the flexibility of the gas network. In other words, we really require an integrated assessment and somehow integrated operation of the two systems because of sort of flexibility constraints that might uh, uh, rise in one network, in this case, the, the, the gas network, and they might impact uh, on, uh, on the other. Uh, next uh, next slide, please. So, sorry to interrupt, Pierluigi, but just to say we are running a bit short of time. We'd like to have some time for questions at the end. Yes. Uh, just to let you know. Thank you. No, thanks. Thanks, Sam. So just I will I would just mention very quickly this kind of uh, uh, interesting case studies that are being uh, developed uh, now here in Australia, just moving to Australia, where we'll be looking at uh, effectively uh, injecting hydrogen from uh, uh, curtailed uh, uh, from, from curtailed renewables effect into the gas network. And the interesting thing that uh, I want to show is uh, if we can go to the next uh, uh, slide. Is uh, again how the flexibility in this case, uh, the the gas system and integrated with the hydrogen system will provide to the electricity system, not so much uh, in terms of uh, uh, balancing as mentioned earlier, but rather in terms of security services, look at uh, frequency response, uh, fast and slower frequency response, various forms of demand response, even black start capabilities and, and this kind of services that were really coming from the availability of uh, uh, hydrogen technologies and also uh, in case supported by the gas network and the possibility of injecting hydrogen into, uh, into the gas network. So this is like the interesting work we're doing for the future pure CRC here uh, in Australia, and it gives a little bit of a different perspective of, of balancing, of be going beyond balancing, but also in terms of uh, uh, security services. So there is lots of interesting work still to be done in this, and uh, I, I give back to you, uh, Adam. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Pierre Luigi. Apologies for the rush there. Um, we're running slightly short of time, so I'd like to move along. Yes, thank you to our next panelist, uh, who is Camilla Palladino. Just a very brief introduction. So Camilla has been Executive Vice President of Corporate Strategy and Investor Relations at SNAM uh, since November 2016. She has an undergrad background from Oxford and a master's from London School of Economics. Has held various positions uh, in, in several oil and gas companies across communications, leadership and talent development, investor relations, etc. So without further ado, hand over to Camilla for some comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adam, and uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Jamie and Perugi. I think I think you've, you've uh, said a lot about gas system flexibility, uh, but I think the point that that I could make here is that it's um, it's set to evolve because as we have uh, increasing amounts of renewables uh, to, to integrate into the energy system on the one hand, and then on the other hand, we have um, increased ease of conversion of power into gas, into hydrogen, as Pierluigi was saying, um, we, will, we will have a, a change, I suppose, in the way uh, the gas system provides flexibility to the energy system overall and to the power system. Um, and to the power system. So perhaps we can go on to the next slide, please. Yes, this, this slide just to make the point that uh, the traditional flexibility that the gas system provided uh, to the energy system overall is hard to replicate, and in particular on the seasonal side of things, um, on everything that, that's required to, to provide the, the seasonal swings, and in terms of the long distance transport um, of, of, um, well, of gas, is is a lot um, more convenient. So you know this obviously leaves an interesting gap for all of these technologies that can use existing gas assets um, 
to uh, to give flexibility to a fully decarbonized uh, energy system. And if you go could go on to the next slide, please. No, and if you can go straight on to the next one. Thank you. Um, so one of the interesting things about long distance transport uh, and, and the way it can provide flexibility to the energy system overall, uh, we think is the opportunity provided by Africa, which is already linked uh, to Europe with um, 45 BCM of transport capacity to Italy, this is. Uh, and this obviously is, is an asset uh, that could be used and it, it, can, it can support an integrated European decarbonized system where um, some of the renewable generation is not on European soil, uh, but in Africa. And that obviously is handy because there's lots of sun and lots of room, uh, potentially, and lower seasonality in terms of in terms of production. And obviously the cost of, of transporting the renewable energy as hydrogen from North Africa to Italy is relatively low. It's lower, we think, than transporting it as ammonia. Um, and, and obviously the, there's a benefit as well compared to renewable electricity, although of course the convenience of the, of the overall value chain will depend on whether you're going to need to be using electricity or hydrogen at the end of it. Uh, next slide, please. This moves us on to Italy. Um, and I think one of the, one of, no, no, that one, yeah. Um, this, this moves us on to Italy. And one of the things I think that is interesting about the Italian energy system is, is that 70 pipelines of the, of the transport pipeline of 33,000 kilometers um, is ready to accept blends of hydrogen up to 100%. We've done a test on 5-10% uh, blending supplied to a pasta factory um, in the south of Italy. Um, and I, I suppose our vision for the network as a whole is that over time it could be an, a segregated hydrogen network on the one hand and a um, low carbon gas methane by methane network on the other. And, and it you know, that the asset itself lends itself to this sort of um, long-term view. Next slide, please. Yes, and, and just to, just to conclude, um, what can happen, obviously, is that if all of the countries start to, uh, start to switch parts of their network, parts of their um, gas networks to hydrogen, you know, gradually, uh, you know, it's going to start with localized network. And then over time, as they stretch out, um, you can you can imagine to connect them uh, rather like the gas network is today. And these connections um, can provide the same sort of, you know, similar sort of security of supply and, and flexibility to the one that the gas network offers today. Um, and there's been a study by 11 uh, TSOs and gas infrastructure companies, that's the study that we're currently looking at, um, that showed by that by about 2040, there could be 23,000 kilometers of hydrogen backbone connecting Europe, connecting all of the, well, these countries in Europe. This was a study done by a number of countries that were working together on different, different work. Um, and it's an open initiative, so other European gas infrastructure companies and associations are encouraged to join in. Um, thank you. I think that brings me to an end. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Camilla, for your input. That, that's a very interesting perspective of industries and some good developments there. So just very quickly, now we have an opportunity for Q&A and I'm going to hand over to Nigel Brandon. Uh, to deal with the Q&A. Just a very brief introduction as before, Nigel is our Dean of Engineering here at Imperial College and is also the Chair of the Sustainable Gas Institute. So over to you, Nigel. Okay, thanks, Adam. Um, now we've had plenty of questions, which is fantastic, and we're not going to be able to get through all of them clearly in the time we've got. So just to say to all of the people who've asked questions, we will be doing our best to come back to you on those questions um, at the close of the webinar and over the coming day or two, so we will do our best to get back to you. I'm going to try and rank my questions to some extent by the number of likes, so we'll kick off, Adam, with one for you, if I may, just a kind of fundamental question about does natural gas have a 
you know, is there a kind of fundamental lifetime to the use of natural gas like we see a fundamental lifetime to the use of coal? Perhaps we just take that question first and then, Jamie, I'll come to you on electrolyzer costs. Adam. Thanks, Nigel. Yeah, I mean, this is this is a really interesting question. It's a really big, big picture question. I think goes beyond the scope of this white paper, but I think uh, it's one, one which is well worth asking. So we've seen that coal is extremely challenged in future energy systems, and the question is, is the same story for gas? And I think really, really this depends on many factors, and I think critically uh, what's clear is that unabated combustion of natural gas in very long-term energy systems would be very difficult if you're going to still meet climate targets. Uh, but this doesn't mean there is no role for, for natural gas. It can be with, associated with blue hydrogen production, for example, with CCS uh, and various other uh, sort of high value applications in industry or other parts of the energy system, such as power generation. Uh, on top of that, I'd say, just to say again that I think the Sustainable Gas Institute, we're very interested in low carbon gases as well. So that's hydrogen, biomethane too. So when we say gas in the future energy system, we think there certainly will be a role. And uh, then there's a follow on question is which type of gas? Thanks. OK, Adam, thank you very much. And perhaps it's worth just reminding folk that um, if we do have any leakage of methane in the production and distribution and end use of natural gas, that's quite a significant player in the um, climate impacts and that um, one of the areas of efforts is to try and understand and address that um, from the set from the industry as a whole. Um, can I just then move Jamie to you? There's some question around um, the cost of making hydrogen from electricity. Uh, so essentially it's around the cost of electrolysis and the need for the, those costs to come down. So when do you expect gas, power to gas to be viable is the question. OK. Um, so that is, it sounds like there's a few aspects to that. In White Paper 3, we do deal uh, with costs of electrolysis um, uh, in a way that we don't in this report. Um, so it's worth going back and having a look at that. Um, at that time, electrolysis is uh, still significantly more expensive than uh, blue hydrogen. So that's producing hydrogen, as Adam just said, from natural gas. Um, I think that's very much an evolving story. And uh, it, it's, uh, it may be fair to say that el electrolysis research has not received uh, the amount of uh, research income that maybe some other uh, avenues have. Um, and that may be increasing now. And it is an aspiration of ours at SGI to understand better this comparison between blue and green hydrogen. So that would be hydrogen uh, produced through electrolysis and renewable electricity. Um, and I think there's some there's some optimism that costs are coming down quite quickly and there's a lot of new work. Uh, and I think it, it's it's worth looking again at that uh, and projections of how quickly um, electrolyzer costs will come down. Um, but that's not dealt with in this report um, and uh, definitely needs um, some more examination. I hope that's enough of an answer. Yep. So Jamie, thank you very much. And it is indeed a topic of great interest at the moment. and. Um, We'll see a number of quite um, positive views on the potential for electrolyzer cost down if it can be taken forward. Um, perhaps I can address a question to Camilla, if I may. And there's, there's a question around the hydrogen readiness of transport pipelines. Camilla, perhaps your best place to give us a view on that. Yes, absolutely. Um, in so, so there's work ongoing on that too. Um, and the work that we've done suggests that, as, as I was saying, about 70% of the pipelines would be hydrogen ready, uh, and that, that's the material used um, would be hydrogen ready. Uh, the, this doesn't include all of the components, right? So, that, you know, you'd need to be looking at valves, all of the instruments that you, you, you need to measure the quality of gas. Um, it doesn't include compressor stations. It doesn't include um, you know, storage. So, so we're just talking about the actual pipes here. Uh, but there is a lot of work ongoing in in terms of trying to figure out, you know, what the what the standards need to be. For example, we've got we've put in a new procurement standard uh, so that all of the all of the pipelines that we build from now on have um, a sort of a hydrogen ready standard. And can I just ask a supplementary for a minute while we're on it? I mean, in terms of in terms of compressors for hydrogen pipelines and pumping hydrogen, um, are there, what's the kind of technology issues there? Is that do we have compressors available if we want you to build a 
hydrogen distribution system? Um, so that again, I think it, it's something that is being developed. There was a test on Friday that we undertook for a blend of hydrogen in a, in a compressor. Um, I think our, I think the the idea is that you know in the beginning some of the hydrogen may be blended into the network um, with with sort of the segmentation into pure hydrogen areas, hydrogen valleys as they're called, as they're called um, coming up you know, during the sort of the 2020s and not not maybe, you know, not immediately. Uh, but but I, I know there's lots of work ongoing into developing all of the hydrogen ready components. OK, that's grand. Thank you, Camilla. Um, we have perhaps one very quick uh, question with one hopefully as quick as you can get it answered. I don't know who wants to pick it up and it's on the issue of hydrogen uh, storage in caverns. So underground hydrogen storage. The question around perhaps, Jamie, for you, uh, are these the are the costs in the report based on UK data, or are they uh, an average of sort of global data on on underground hydrogen storage? Yeah, thanks, Nigel Holmes and Nigel Brandon. I think Nigel Holmes asked that question. That those costs are based on the um, estimates that we published in the white paper three, um, and the, the references are there. And I'll get back to you, Nigel. Um, with, but that's uh, that includes estimates in the UK and. Uh, these estimates are, of course, very location specific because um, you're dealing with, you know, uh, different geologies uh, in different countries that present different challenges, uh, and that's why there's that variation in those estimates. Um, but I can get back to Nigel with those okay. exact references. Jamie, thank you, and we're going to try and do our best to get back to all of the questions that we've not yet had a chance to address. Um, I think that brings time for Q&A to a close, I'm afraid. Um, I would like to say to those who've asked the question that the webinar will be made available. So you will have a chance to see this webinar, the recording of it um, uh, after the event. Um, but Adam, over to you. Thank you, Nigel. So we've, we've run to the end of our time here. So unfortunately, no more time for questions. But for those of you uh, who need to leave, I just want to wrap up. So firstly, thank you very much, um, firstly to all of the audience for joining us. We think, I hope you found it to be an interesting event and thanks to Jamie for the presentation and uh, especially to our two panelists who do for their time, Pierre Luigi and Camilla, thank you very much for providing your input, very interesting. Uh, the reports will be available for download from the SGI website immediately after the launch. Uh, that also includes a handy two page summary of the report. Uh, you can always follow us on social media and subscribe to our newsletters. Uh, there's a link here and, and the uh, presentation will be circulated later, later on. And if you have any queries, don't hesitate to get in touch. Uh, so thank you very much for attending the event from all over the world. Uh, it's great to see so many people interested in this topic and we look forward to the next event with the SGI. Thank you.